times and bad times. The good times were as good as I could ever get. I had more fun, more joy in the good times. And the bad times might just as well have been like going to the doctor and having say, well, I'm sorry to tell you, but you're terminal, you know, and then you really feel the full effect of the illness. Now I know why I feel this bad. My life my career is full of serendipity. I grew up in the business. My father was an assistant director, production manager, an actor. His father was a very important director of his time, a man named Jay Gordon Edwards. So I just sort of naturally took the motion picture business for granted. I acted in a film, if you want to call it acting, called Ten Gentlemen from West Point. I was one of the cadets. If you look very fast, you can see that. And I began to realize that, uh, that it was a fairly easy way to make money. I didn't aspire to being a great actor or anything like that. And uh, I didn't aspire, let's say. A friend of mine, a guy that I went to high school with and who was in S Stanford Law School, came down and uh, we went to a movie, saw a Western. And I criticized it all over the place. Somehow we arrived at the idea that we would write our own screenplay. And we made a Western. We ended up making two. And my career just sort of progressed, took off. Always in his movies, every scene, every shot was mounted with class. The first one that really kind of propelled me into the spotlight, so to speak, was uh, Operation Petticoat with Cary Grant. Blake Edwards came to the Pink Panther having made two rather different films. Uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's, still a completely charming and very popular movie today, and Days of Wine and Roses, a very disturbing look at alcoholism. They were an enigma, and they provided us with the ability of not having to answer to a releasing organization like United Artists. When the studio system collapsed in the 1950s, there was an opening for guys like the Mirish brothers, Marvin, Harold, and Walter. And they came in, and they understood that what filmmakers needed was not a big piece of real estate with all kinds of craft departments and, and sets and all that kind of stuff that the studios had. What they need, needed was a small, efficient operation that could arrange financing, that could do contracts for people, um, that could orchestrate pre-production work and post-production work, um, and it worked. They had their own publicity department, their own production department, their own everything. And like a, they were like a miniature major. What they didn't do is interfere with filmmakers' artistic creativity. Um, they let guys like Billy Wilder um, and Blake Edwards do the kinds of films that they wanted to do without a lot of interference. Our philosophy was to create a family. We gravitated naturally to Blake Edwards, who we felt was a uh, potential natural heir of Billy Wilder's. We dealt creatively with the Mirishes, and the Mirishes said, look, you're good enough 
for us to hire you. You go make the movies. Let us take care of United Artists. Uh, Harold Marish didn't particularly want me to do the Pink Panther. He didn't understand it. And he told me so. Not in so many words, but he said, can't you, you know, come up with something else? And I said, no, I, I feel good about this. And I was really testing him to see, you know, whether or not his promise to me was uh, genuine. And it was. A writer named Maurice Richland that I had met on Petticoat. We sat down and we dreamed up the idea of a, of a heist. The focus of the idea was that a European inspector of police was trying to find, trying to capture this famous jewel thief. He was unaware that his wife was cuckolding him with the jewel thief. My angel. He told me the story and I became most enthusiastic about the, the story. I tried to get Audrey to play the princess and wasn't successful. Uh, I did fairly well with Claudia Cardinale. We decided to offer the, uh, the leading role, or it was at the time, in the picture to David Niven. I really loved him a lot and we enjoyed each other. And he's a pretty damn good actor too. We made an arrangement uh, to secure the services of Ava Gardner to play uh, Inspector Clouseau's wife. And we cast the film with Peter Ustinov. And you can see how, what kind of a inspector he would play. We decided to shoot it in Rome and uh, everything went along swimmingly until, I don't know, four or six weeks Prior to uh, filming, uh, Ava Gardner uh, withdrew from the cast. Blake uh, then suggested that we replace her with Capucine. And everything was set. They all headed over to Rome to begin sh shooting the film the following week, except for Ustinov. He backed out at the very last minute. We were then faced with the huge problem of replacing Peter Ustinov in the picture. And uh, that, that really was our, our very first crisis. We had to shift everything around, really literally in the last week. And we were desperate. I was in Europe, ready to start shooting a film. The most we could do was sue him. We sued Peter uh, Ustinov for suing too. When the picture came out and it was a huge success, uh, I remember a lawyer saying to me, can you prove any damages? We weren't damaged, we were helped. <laughs> An agent suggested Peter Sellers. I was unaware of Peter Sellers except for one film that he had done up to that point, which was a film called I'm All Right, Jack. And I thought, that pudgy, kind of cockney. And they said, no, no, that's a character he played. He's, and they gave me his whole history and I was kind of desperate at that point. So I said, well, let's, okay, let's take a shot at it. Peter Sellers came from a showbiz family of long standing in, uh, in Britain. His great great grandfather, Daniel Mendoza, was the greatest Jewish prize fighter of the 18th century. A couple of generations later, his, I guess his granddaughter became a uh, vaudeville music hall impresario. Uh, she put her kids on the stage, including Peter Sellers' his mother. Um, when Peter Sellers was born, his mother was still doing performing and was quite a dynamic personality. He was an only child, but as his friend Graham Stark put it, it was an absurd only child. In other words, he was indulged beyond all limits. And I met him at the plane in Rome. And from the plane to the hotel in Rome, he and I discovered each other, so to speak. What we enjoyed in terms of comedy, which meant the world of Laurel and Hardy. Peter, Peter Sellers was the greatest fan of Stan Laurel I've known. I mean, I went to Peter's apartment, which he had in Victoria in London, a beautiful place, and um, 
He had all these photographs all over the place and he pointed to the wall and there was a small picture and it was about uh, seven by four of Stan Laurel. He said, that's, that is the picture. That's my favorite picture. Well, Sellers was a great admirer of, of Stan Laurel and uh, went to visit him when he was in, in Los Angeles uh, when Laurel was an old man. Um, he admired, I think, what Laurel could do with his, with his face. Uh, like Stan Laurel, Sellers was always dignified, no matter how bad the situation was. There was a look of, of self-possession self on him, and I think he gets that in part from Laurel. We rehearsed for two weeks, which was incredible, because Peter would do something, and then Blake would say, well, now, if you add this to it, and it was almost like a stepladder. It just kept going and going and going. We'd take what was on the page and ad lib and work around it. And Peter said, could we make the character more physically comedic? Sellers was originally a vocal comedian. Uh, he got his best bits from the radio. He did his best bits early on on the radio. Sellers couldn't do the physical things at all. He was not a good physical comedian. I had to set him up for it. And that clues up me. Oh, how did I hurt you? No. Are you all right? Yes, I'm fine. You, you sure now? Yes, I am. Oh, my darling, I'm so yes, sorry. Being a, a genetic Clouseau myself, that's what would probably happen to me. I, in my life, have broken just about every bone in my body. And that usually, if I relate those instances, I can get you laughing. I did this damage three days ago as I walked into my doctor's office. And there was a sign on the door that said, door hard to open. And so I leaned against the door and went flying into his outer room with two geriatric patients, an elderly man and woman, who were stunned to see this body flying in the doctor's door, lit on the floor on my back. His wife, who runs the office, came out and said, Mr. Edwards, what happened? And I said, oh, I just dropped in. Well, that feels good. <laughs> That's the kind of physical humor that appeals to me. Blake Edwards talked at one point <clears throat> about how he had learned from the director, Leo McCary, something called breaking the pain barrier. In other words, you take audiences to a point where it's really painful, and then you go through that, and you keep the thing going and make it even more painful, and just to see how far you can go. So much of the early filmmaking, the one and two reelers, were just that. We must find that woman. Blake had control but in a wonderful way so that nobody ever resented his control, you know? The minute Sellers came into it, Sellers began to sort of take over. I've really got him this time. Blake was very smart and realized uh, what was happening. And instead of fighting it, uh, he encouraged it. The child is our man. My every instinct tells me so. Careful, you fool. You realize his gun is loaded? something sets you off and you say, wouldn't it be funny if, and you try that, and then it, it, it begins to have a life of its own almost. When the picture started out, David Niven had the leading role. When it finished, Peter Sellers did, and the script was barely changed. How did you ever manage it? Well, you know, wasn't easy. Peter Sellers was a brilliant actor, and everything he did was very funny. Peter was a great improvisational actor. We had a problem with the crew breaking up. You're talking about comic invention that borders on genius. I enjoy the proscenium. I see things like a proscenium. Uh, there was a guy who had a way of staging his actors. He always had his actors moving around and 
always the important line took place in front of the camera and then the actor would move away. I'm saying this in a very coarse way. And then something else would happen and then the camera would be here. And it would be on this part and this was very important. And you never had to cut. Well, I've always been intrigued with kind of fado farce and in one door and out the other and, and seeing things or not seeing things, hearing things that are off stage. Simone. Yes, dear. But Jack, I thought you were on your way to... phone call was a ruse. It was, I think, designed as a sort of big, glamorous, international kind of glossy uh, piece of fluff. If I'm going to make a film, particularly that kind of a film, I'd like to make it in places that have great restaurants at night and great hotels to stay in and places that I have not been before. And that's kind of the, the, the mood of it, is, is let's fly here, let's fly there, and it's all very um, thin and wonderful. <laughs> I don't think anyone would disagree with the notion that a Pink Panther film without the music of Henry Mancini would not be a Pink Panther film. He and Blake, their thinking just seemed to gel all the time. He just was enormously talented. He came up with this, uh, this concept, which would feature a tenor saxophone. And Mancini always cast his musicians just as a director would cast actors in a film. In this case, he knew that he wanted Plaz Johnson, the great tenor saxophonist, um, to play that theme. His warm tone, uh, kind of swinging style, was what Mancini wanted. That was Hank. He was a consummate musician and knew me well, knew what I, and knew humor, my humor well. A shot in the dark was, a, was an unintentional clue. It was originally a play, a Broadway play, with Walter Matthau. And it didn't resemble the film, really, the film at all. It was a mystery story, but it was talky. It was, it was confined to one or two sets. Sellers was supposed to do it, and he... Uh, he didn't want to do it. He was desperate not to do it. And he came to me and said, you know, uh, I don't like the whole setup. Can't you step in? And it had to be shot at a certain time. The stages had been uh, rented. And they already, I think, were, had the principal set built. And I said, Jesus, Peter, I wouldn't. I, I read the screenplay and I said, no, I won't. I won't direct this. I, I don't like it, and you know, I thank you for asking me. But and he kept after me. He said, "Isn't there some way?" And I, uh, I remember on the phone one night saying, "Listen, the only way that I can think of me taking this over, and you would really have to make it okay because it means I know they have to get rid of a director and all kinds of things, and you have to do all of that stuff apart from me because." But I can only recommend that the way to do it is to make the character Cluzo. And that did it for Sellers. He jumped at it and he went to the Marishes and he did whatever had to be done. And the next thing I know, I'm on the, an ocean liner with Bill Blatty and uh, we're writing a screenplay to incorporate Cluzo. There are a couple of things that are repeated um, motifs or themes or whatever, or characters uh, that didn't appear in the first Pink Panther. Dreyfus, uh, who goes first insane, then more insane, then increasingly more insane, until he is completely demented. <laughs> I'm going to kill him. <laughs> the loyal and trusted friend and servant, Cato, who tries to teach Clouseau martial arts technique. <laughs> Inspector Clouseau's residence, 
Clouseau is actually surprisingly good at it. But Cato often gets the raw end of the, of the deal on that. By the way, Cato, that was a very good workout today. You're showing marked improvement. Every day you're getting better. In the first film, he has all of the physical fun. He didn't have the accent. Brunico, but that, that's, uh, that's in Brunico. I, I mean, that's 30 miles from here. Peter went to Paris for a weekend, disappeared. We didn't know where he was. Came back, and when I was just about ready to chew his ass, which happened quite frequently, he said, I ran into a concierge in Paris who talked like this. No, but wh what I do not understand is that in a household of this size, that the question of mirth should be brought to the attention of Monsieur Ballon, not one of the servants. So I said, we got to use it. He could do anybody's voice, anybody. He was a compulsive impersonator. He needed to assume other characters. And I heard a voice say, Hiya, Ralph, how are you? And it's, it, was just, it was Walter Mirisch. I turned around, it was Peter doing Walter Mirisch. Peekaboo. I experienced all the charms and pitfalls of uh, Peter Sellers' character. I have a plan. Peter got on the phone, took off Walter Mirisch, talking to this actor, telling him, get, get off that picture. It's going to be a load of crap. Get off of it and come and work on my movie. He got Walter's wife on the phone and, and had her crazy because she thought she was talking to her husband. Most regrettable. Peter was an exceedingly complicated man. The bigger Peter Sellers got in his mind, the more difficult he could be with his directors. But I think if you got too close to him, he could be very, very temperamental. He had a lot of trouble and uh, a lot of turmoil in his life. You know, both he and, and Blake uh, reacted uh, very fiercely uh, to their relationship after shot in the dock, and, and they both said they didn't want to work together again. Peter actively disliked the picture. Uh, I remember him talking to me once and telling me he, he didn't think it should be released. Uh, I think it is as good, if not a better picture, than, than The Pink Panther. 1964 was a very big and very difficult year for Sellers. He had finished shooting The Pink Panther. He had finished shooting A Shot in the Dark. He was told by his psychic that he was going to get in contact with someone with the initials B.E. who would have a major influence on his life. He understood it to mean Britt Eklund, who had just checked into the Dorchester Hotel. So he met Britt Eklund, and two weeks later they were married. He then flew over to Hollywood to appear in Billy Wilder's comedy, Kiss Me Stupid. And he and Wilder didn't hit it off too well. Sellers didn't like Wilder's working methods. and pretty much vice versa. And the next thing you know, Sellers suffered a series of major heart attacks and nearly died. He, his heart would stop, it started up again, it stop again, it started up over and over through the course of a week. It really took a lot out of him and I think it changed, it changed him profoundly. There were certain colors that he couldn't uh, tolerate around him, had to be taken away. Howard's had to repaint a train because uh, uh, the, the color offended him. I told Blake I'd like to prepare another script, which we called Inspector Clouseau. Uh, Peter again said he didn't want to have anything to do with the character anymore. Audiences didn't want anyone but Peter, and consequently the film suffered from that. Talking to Blake, Later on in the 60s, I said, it, it's just a crime not to make another, another Clouseau picture with Peter. And, and he said he'd been thinking that too. They were used to fighting with each other. They understood that they could make a really, a really great film together again, and they needed the work. And so they did it. And it turned out beautifully. Onwards and upwards to the top. Mm. It is my karma, what? my destiny. By the time he and Edwards reconnected for the second part of the Panther series, he needed, needed to earn some serious money, and he did. The last three Panthers that he made made him a very rich man. How much did they get? 
millions. Here's the report. All right, uh, that will be all, Francois. Thank you. They didn't get on at all in the last couple. Didn't get on at all. And uh, they went their own ways and done other, fi other films. But really, when you look at it, together they were brilliant. Steinway. Not anymore. Peter Sellers was the most brilliant man you've ever seen when he was on. Does your dear go bad? No. Oh. Oh. Yeah, it's dear good. <laughs> I thought you said your dear did not bite. That is not my talk. He had married a very young uh, woman, beautiful young woman. He'd had plastic surgery, and yet he was quite ill. He had a pacemaker. He had a lot of difficulty with his pacemakers. Uh, it was a difficult time of his life. Can't tell you how many times, we, particularly toward the end, that we had to have Joe Dunn, his double, who doubled him perfectly, come in and do this thing. He wasn't the f healthiest guy in the world, so he wouldn't exert himself too much if he didn't have to which was good for me. I mean, uh, I didn't mind doing that sort of stuff. I went all over the world with a guy. That was great. If anything, he's more fondly remembered now, uh, 22 years after he died, than, uh, than at the time he died. <laughs> the great genius of Peter and Mancini's music and the cartoon character and, and Blake inspired by what he was doing produced this extraordinary film which still continues to entertain audiences throughout the world. Good night, sir.